Hey there, this is the second part of the chapter eight um, lecture video, so let's get into it. So what I want to do is uh, begin with the topic of um, core versus valence electrons. So let's go ahead and um, put up a electron configuration for an atom that we can use to explain this. Let's choose chlorine. So chlorine, see if you can write his electron configuration and we will just do the electron configuration, not the orbital diagram. All right, so chlorine, go to your periodic table, figure out how many electrons you have to place into orbitals and you will find that chlorine has 17 electrons. And as you are writing the electron configuration, you are filling up the um, lower energy sublevels first. So the first sublevel to get filled up is the 1s, and he will be full. And then just keep on moving according to the diagonal rule um, in order of the energy levels of orbital filling. So 2s is next, then 2p. 3s would be filled up next. That now has placed 12 electrons, and the last five will be in the 3p sublevel. So that would be your electron configuration for chlorine. All right, so in every electron configuration, which really is just showing you what orbitals have electrons in them um, for a particular atom, you can divide the um, electrons into two groups, um, the core versus the valence electrons. So let's start with the core. Core electrons are just like the same concept as an apple core. An apple core is on the inside of an apple. So the core electrons are the ones on the inside of the atom, whereas the valence electrons are on the outside of the atom. So let's go ahead and um, show you how to identify where to, draw the, where to draw the boundary between what we call the inside and the outside of the atom. All right, so let me go ahead and label these the valence, and I'll tell you why in just a moment, and these the core. All right, and I'll say a few things about each, each uh, type here. So let's start with the valence. These ones here are called the valence electrons. Valence electrons. Um, let's first tell you how I was able to, to know where the valence began um, and where the core ended. So I knew, I knew the boundary was right here. How did I know that? The valence electrons are the electrons in orbitals with the highest n value. Um, they're actually, another way to say it would be the orbitals in the highest principal energy level, but for me it's kind of easier to just come back to the quantum numbers. So when you're looking at your electron configuration, I see n values of 1, 2, and 3. So you just pick the highest number. Um, the highest number in this electron configuration is three. So anything with a three are valence electrons. All right. So what I so these two are valence as well as these five. So what you'll notice is that is that chlorine, and we'll kind of come back to this in a little while later, has seven valence electrons. These two and those five. Okay. All right, so those are the valence electrons. And let's say a few more things about it before we go and start commenting on core electrons. Oh, real quick, one more thing about this. They're the ones with the highest n value. Now, that's true for main group elements. Chlorine is a main group element, remembering that main group elements, um, in this picture, I'm going to use this picture a little bit later, but main group elements would be the ones in the first two columns, so what I have in red. And the last six, what I have in blue, those are main group. Um, however, one more note here. For, let me do a little star. For transition metals or for transition elements, you also add or you also include, let me use the word include, include the outer T's. Let me go ahead and put an example of that up real quick here. Let me just pick any transition metal. How about we choose titanium? Titanium, um, atomic number 22. Let me just put his electron configuration up on the board real quick. 1s2, 2s2, 2p6. 3s2, 3p6. 4s2, 3d2. All right. So when you're trying to get the, um, figure out what the valence electrons are for 
a transition metal. TI is a transition metal, number 22. Um, it's still the same rule. It's the electrons in the orbitals with the highest end value. So I'm looking at ones, twos, threes, and fours, and I'll pick, obviously this one would be valence. Okay, because the four is the highest end value. But the rule is for transition metals, which this is, you also include the outer Ds. So you would also include the outer Ds, these ones. So this titanium would have four valence electrons. These two and those two. Okay, those would be your valence electrons. All right, so that's just one thing I wanted to make sure I put up there about how to identify them. Let's go on and say a few more things about valence electrons. Valence electrons are on the outside of the atom's electron cloud. Remember, coming back to chlorine for a minute, the 3s and the 3p are large orbitals far away from the nucleus. So if you have electrons in those orbitals, they are on the outside of the atom, very far away from what? Far away from the nucleus. So because they're far away from the nucleus, remember the nucleus is what is attracting the electrons towards the atom. The nucleus has the positivity. The electrons are negative. So if you're far away from what is holding you on, then on the, they are on the, outside of, um, on the outside of the atom's electron cloud and thus, held more loosely onto the atom. If you wanted to write, it's because they're far away from the nucleus. So the valence electrons are held loosely by the atom because they're far away from the nucleus. And that has a major implication, and that is bullet point number three. These are the electrons involved in bonding with other atoms. like with neighboring atoms. Because they're held loosely, and frankly, because they're the ones that are closest to the other atoms, okay? If you're on the outside of one atom, you're near the outside of another guy's atom. Um, because they're on the outside, they are involved in bonding. Now, let's just review. There's two types of bonding. I'm not gonna write this because I'm running out of room, but ionic bonding means that these are the electrons that can be um, transferred from one atom to another. So because they're held loosely, they can be lost by the atom or picked up um, by a neighboring atom. So that refer that's what happens with ionic bonding. You have transfer of electrons. The other type of bonding is covalent bonding, where the electrons are shared between the two atoms. But for the very same reason, they're, you're able to do that because they're on the outside of the atom um, and they're held not so tightly by their own nucleus. All right, and so, Valence electrons being involved in bonding. And this is going to end up being really important as we move into chapter nine. Let's come over here and just define real quickly the core electrons. The core electrons are all the others. All the other electrons. So how it usually works is figure out which ones are your valence electrons first. All the rest will be core. So coming to titanium. If those are valence electrons, the 4s2 and the 3d2, then all the others would be considered core electrons. And the atom will have as many as it has. I mean, all different types of atoms have different numbers of core electrons. So um, that's how you would figure it out. Figure out the valence first, and all the others would be core. So these, the, these are all the others. These are the, the electrons that are on the relative inside. of the atom's electron cloud, fairly close to the nucleus, and thus held more tightly onto the atom. Therefore, this is a therefore. Um, let me do this little therefore sign. These are not available. for transfer or sharing with nearby atoms. Nearby atoms. So they're not involved in bonding. And 
scientists very much care about bonding. That's a huge part of chemistry. So it's, that's the whole purpose is to define which electrons are actually the ones involved in bonding and which are not. Okay, I think I froze a minute, but I'm back now. All right, so core versus valence electrons. All righty, so now, um, and just remembering that we define the valence electrons slightly differently with main group elements as we do for transition metals. All righty. So now that we have this topic of valence electrons, let me go ahead and talk about how this plays out in relationship to the periodic table. All right, let me show you this really important figure. I would always show this in, in, the, um, in the lecture if we were together in school. Um, it is figure 8.7 on page 348. Very, very important figure to chemistry. Let me see if I can get that. And the figure is called orbital blocks. Well, I'll talk about the orbital blocks in just a minute. But go ahead and find that figure in your book or at least look at it on the slide here. What you're looking at is um, someone has written the electron configurations for every um, atom. If you want to go ahead and zero in on chlorine, okay. you will see that they wrote 3s2, 3p5. It's exactly what we just did, figured out the valence electrons. And they did it for all the other atoms as well on the periodic table. And what is important to note is this, and I'll put this on the board in just a second, is that elements that are in the same column on the periodic table. So for instance, you can stay in the halogen column for a minute, chlorine, fluorine, bromine, iodine. If you look at their electron configurations and zero in just on their valence electrons, you'll see something really important to understanding chemistry. And that is elements in the same column, what we call groups, always have the same number and type of valence electrons. Let me go ahead and put some stuff on the board here. So I'll leave chlorine here. Let me do the, um, so these are um, the valence electrons. Chlorine has seven valence electrons. And not only just does it have seven, but two of them are S, five of them are P. Um, let me just take that element right underneath it, bromine. Actually, you know what? For the sake of time, let me pick a smaller element. Let me pick the element right above it, chlorine. If you were to just kind of come at it and try to do fluorine electron configuration, you would write you would write 1s2, 2s2, 2p5. And so if you were just to kind of look at his electron configuration, look at his valence electron, you would see that he also has seven valence electrons. Two of them are s, five of them are p. All right. So what we're trying to note here is this very important key point in chemistry. Elements in the same group which is really just the word for column have the same number not only number but also type kind of like they're in the same type of orbitals um, of valence electrons now that might not seem like that big of a deal, but if you just connect the dots together, you can see how important this is here. Valence electrons, well, let me, write, let me put this in your notes. Since valence electrons are the ones important in bonding, and frankly, and many other chemical properties. Okay, these valence electrons are kind of like the actors. This explains something very, very central to chemistry. This explains um, why um, the elements in the same group act the same. That's why we can even give nicknames to the columns. Like for instance, this column 7A, group 7A, that's why we can call them halogens. 
we learned a long time ago, they all act the same. They form the same type of, um, of molecules. They form the same type of ions. So it was one minus ions when they form ions um, and, and various other chemical properties as well. That was something that we knew a long time ago before quantum mechanics. Uh, Dmitry Mendeleev, way back when, is the one who figured that out, that you could have this arrangement of the elements and you could arrange them in this, in this table-like format and there were these periodic properties. Remember, periodic law. Um, same thing with, you know, talk about the alkali metals, the first column. If you look at all of their valence electrons, they're all one valence electron in an S orbital. So now that we know about quantum mechanical model, we can explain why they all acted the same this whole time. It's because their valence electrons were in this, you had the same number and type of orbital that they were in. And because the valence electrons are the whole driving force behind, behind many chemical processes, chemical bonding, that kind of thing, that explains the commonality between all of these elements. Not only that, um, it's, it's even more than that. So let's go ahead and hold up this slide here. Now this is very similar. This is, I just, it's easier for me to hold. I colored the colors slightly different than what are in the book. But um, now that we know about this whole concept of valence electrons, when you look at the periodic table, you can divide it into what we call orbital blocks. Okay, so go ahead. Let me just sketch this on your board here. So we have this, this concept, this key point, um, which kind of unites quantum mechanical theory to the periodic table in general. It explains this kind of column um, commonality between the elements. Let me put up a periodic table here. The, the periodic table is organized into we call, what we call orbital blocks. And there's four of them. So in your notes, go ahead and label. The first two columns are called the S block. It's what I had in red there, and I'm going to show you it in a, in again in a second. Um, in addition, though, the let me actually include hydrogen, and let me also include helium. Helium is also in the S block. In my picture, you'll notice I had colored him red as well with the other S's. Okay, that's going to show up. That's going to be important in just a minute. So that's the S block, the first two columns, and also helium. The last six columns are called the P block. And we'll talk about what in the world these things, why is it called that in just a second. The middle, the dip down area, is called the D block. And the lower two rows, two periods, is called the F block. All right. So it comes back to the valence electrons. But essentially, let's use the S block to explain here. What does it mean to be in the S block? Like, why is it called that? What that means is that the very last electron that was added is in an S orbital. That's what that really means. So if you're in it, if you're in the S block, any of these elements, your very last electron in your orbital diagram or your electron configuration was an S orbital, uh, was in an S orbital. So that's what that means. Same, I'll write it over here. There's some more room. Same with the P block these ones that I have in blue, like the chlorine member, his last electron, um, it was 3s2, 3p5. So the very last one was in a p orbital. That's what it means to be in the p block. So essentially, you could write the p block. Um, the last electron added kind of in your electron configuration was in a p orbital. And that's what why we call it the P block. The D block, remember that titanium one? Where would we do that in just a little bit ago? Titanium, right there. Um, the very last one, it was 3D2. The very last one that we added was in the D orbitals. And the same with the F block. The very last one, if you did these electron configurations, would be in, in an F orbital. All right, so you can divide your periodic table into these four blocks. Now, there's some really important things to notice, and this is, this is really kind of a bigger deal than I'm probably making it here. If you count the number of columns in each block, you find something really fascinating. In the S block, there are two columns. Go ahead and count the number of columns in the P block. You will find that there are six columns. 
and the D block, go ahead and count them on your periodic table. You will find that there are 10 columns. And in your F block, take a moment, count how many columns you see, and you will see that there are 14 columns. And if you are thinking with me here, those numbers should look familiar. Two, six, 10, and 14. Where have we seen those before? I'll use the D block to, uh, to kind of make this little note here. These numbers, 2, 6, 10, and 14 correspond to, correspond to the maximum number of electrons that sublevel can hold. You remember, a D sublevel can hold 10 electrons. Why? Because D sublevels come as a set of five orbitals. Why? Because in Schrodinger's equations, L, um, an L value equal to two was D, and ML could be negative two, negative one, zero, positive one, positive two, that's five orientations. This is a huge deal, a huge deal, because remember, the periodic table was discovered hundred, like over 100 years ago by Dmitry Mendeleev. This column organization was already there. This is just, this was just essentially um, data being understood and interpreted and he, and he just arranged them and said, you know, the, the noble gases, remember the whole thing about how, okay, they're unreactive, they're gas at room temperature, all of this stuff, so he grouped them together, but he arranged them in order of their size. All of this structure of the periodic table was already known. But nobody really knew why it looked like this, okay? Why was there this dip down area right here? Why are these two separate columns at the bottom? Why are they 14 long? Why is this six long, you know, six columns wide, whereas this one's only two columns wide? Why? Well, all of it is explained by quantum mechanical model. It's this beautiful connection between theory, which is what Einstein um, Niels Bohr, all of these men, uh, Max Planck, de Broglie, Schrodinger, Heisenberg, they all came up with this quantum mechanical theory, got to the place where they get these numbers, and then it matches what we see in real life. And that is proof, as best proof as you can get, that we're on the right track with this model because the numbers match the math. That's beautiful. That's just, that's just so cool. So just make sure you're getting that. The number of columns in your block corresponds to the maximum number that you can hold. P block has six because P orbitals come as a set of three. You can hold two electrons each, two, four, six. S orbitals, or the S block is two. He has an, an S orbital, it's just a single orbital, two electrons max. And F, remember, seven different orientations, seven orbitals, seven times two is 14. And so that is why the, the number of columns corresponds to the um, number of electrons that, that you can hold. Let's say there's a few more amazing things on this that you don't want to miss here. Let's go back to chlorine, because we were looking at chlorine and fluorine earlier. Let me label just them, fluorine and chlorine. If you look at the group number, the name, remember we're using the names that have A's and B's in them. You'll notice that fluorine and chlorine, the halogens are in group 7A. The group name all of a sudden will have a meaning to you that it maybe never had before. The group number corresponds to or equals the number of valence electrons. Um, on that atom. So it's actually quite easy to figure out the number of valence electrons, just find out what group number it's in. Um, so fluorine, because it's in group seven, seven A has seven valence electrons. We saw that when we did it out. When, so it's very simple to kind of find out aluminum. Aluminum, you don't even have to write out an electron configuration. If I just ask you how many valence electrons are on it, just go up to its group number. Remember, we are using the A's and the B's. It has three, and it does. You could check it yourself. Aluminum has three valence electrons. Titanium. 
We did him earlier. Look at his group number. Whoops. 4B. Remember, he had four valence electrons. Um, we could just do plenty of other examples. Let's do nitrogen. Nitrogen. How many valence electrons does it have? It's not a hard question. It would just have five. Now, you could check it out by yourself with his electron configuration, but you'd see for yourself it definitely has five. So the number of valence electrons corresponds to the group number. The period number all of a sudden has another set of, an, an another significance as well. Let's just fixate on chlorine for a minute. What period number is chlorine? Chlorine is period number three. So once again, these are the period numbers. Let me give you something to write. The period number corresponds to the highest n value in the electron configuration. That's what the period number means. Um, when we did chlorine, you remember it was 3s2, 3p5. So the highest number that you saw was a 3. That is consistent with his period number. Aluminum. What is the highest n value in his electron configuration? All you have to do is look at what period aluminum is in. Aluminum is in period number 3 as well. Okay, So he has the same highest n value as chlorine. Um, titanium. He is in period number 4. And that is his highest n value, which you'll remember he did have a 4 in his electron configuration. Um, some people would call this the highest principal energy level that the electrons occupy, and that's also true. Um, I just like thinking about it from the point of view of n value. So that's another thing about your periodic table I don't want you to miss. The, the group numbers and the period rows numbers all of, a, all of a sudden have significance or connection to your electron configurations. Um, the last thing I'll mention is there are a few electron configurations that are a little bit different than what you would expect copper and chromium being two examples. If you're doing your readings, you'll notice that. I will not be worrying about that little detail. We're going to kind of pass over that detail, the copper and chromium exceptions. But they're there. All right, now, here is the last thing I want to say before we move on to periodic properties. Now that we have explained orbital blocks and the structure of the periodic table and the significance of the, the period numbers, there is another way to write electron configurations, which frankly, the, the farther you go in chemistry, the more you're going to prefer this way. This is the way that I would do it. Um, the way I taught you earlier with the diagonal rule is not really how I do it. It's a good starting way to learn because it helps you appreciate why everything is the way that it is. And if you do it first, you'll actually understand it better. So that's actually why I teach it that way. However, there is a shortcut way. Um, and it's just to basically read your periodic table. You can just read your periodic table like a piece of music or like a book and write electron configurations. And so this is how I'm going to show you how to do it. Let's start with something easy first. Let's start with, um, let's start with fluorine. So fluorine. It's almost like a, a game, almost like the game Candyland where you like start at start and then you like move a square every single time. That's kind of like the process what we're going to be doing. So if I want to write the electron configuration for fluorine, okay, you locate it on your periodic table, and think of that as like your end of your game. The beginning is always starting at H. And what you want to do is just basically, um, you want to start with your period number. So H is number one. And then you basically just comment on how many squares you're passing over on your way to fluorine. And you really read it like, um, left to right, top to bottom, like we do like in you know book reading or music reading. So I basically say one, and then if this is in the S block, I say S, and it is, and I so is H E though. So these are both S. And how many squares have I passed over? So one S two. Now keep reading. Two S two, because I passed over two, two blocks. So that's where the well, the two is from here, and then the S is from what um, orbital block I'm in, and then two is the 2s2 two is the number of squares. And then I'm still in period two, but now I'm over here. So I say 2p, and then I just count how many squares. One, two, three, four, five. 2p5. So let me write that on the board. We're probably not going to do anything with the f block in terms of electron configuration, so I'll just feel comfortable erasing that. 
So fluorine, what I just said is, whoops, 1s2, 2s2, whoops, and then 2p5. So you just write like this, 1s, two spaces, 2s, two squares, 2p5, and that got you to your, your goal, which is fluorine. Okay, let's do a couple more. How about we can do phosphorus? So find phosphorus, P, phosphorus. So I just read my periodic table. Starting O is at kind of the start. So you say 1, S2, because he's in the S block and I went two squares. 2, S2, 2, because I'm still on period 2. 2, P6, I pass all the way through all 6 to get to, I'm on my way to floor, uh, phosphorus. Now I'm at 3, S2. Empty space, empty space, empty, empty space. Three, P, two, three, to get to phosphorus. So what I just said was one S2, two S2, two P6, three S2, three P, three. And that got me to phosphorus. Really what you're noticing here is that before we were relying on the um, diagonal rule to tell us what order they get filled up, like, okay, after 2P, then it's 3S, then it's 3P. At the end of the day, the whole structure of the periodic table tells you the order that, that, get, that they get filled up. In other words, why after 3S did I hit 3P? It's because that's just what you read. Then you hit the 3Ps. Okay, let's do another one because I need to talk to you about what happens with the Ds. How about, let's go ahead and do, um, let's do iron. I think we did iron a while ago in the notes. Let's do iron. I want to do one that is actually in the D block. Okay, so you don't even have to, like, you're not even counting um, um, electrons or whatever. Just find him on your periodic table. There he is right there. So that's where we're going to end our, like, board game or whatever. So you start up at one. 1s2, 2s2, 2p6 on the way to iron, 3s2, 3p6, now we're at 4, 4s2, okay, now here's the only thing, when you enter your D block, and if you're doing the period, if you're trying to do your electron configurations using this method that I'm showing you here, while you're in the D block, you have to do subtract one from your n value. n minus one is really gonna be where you are in your d block. So I was just here, I had just said 4s2. When you go to do your d block, you have to go back down to three, 3d2. Okay, and that's what, oh wait, I'm doing iron. 3d, one, two, three, four, five, six, 3d6. And that would be the right electron configuration for iron. So it's 1s2, let me just write on the board, 2s2, 2p6, 3s2, 3p6, 4s2, 3d6. Um, and you'll notice that's the whole n minus 1. While you're in the d block, you have to subtract the 1. Now, be careful of that, though. Um, oh, and by the way, that explains why the 3d orbitals get filled up after the 4s orbitals. It's all right there embedded in your periodic table. In other words, you don't see this drop down of the transition metals. You don't get D, Ds at all getting filled until the fourth period. Do you see that? That explains why this is not shifted up on your periodic table. No one used to know that. It didn't make sense until quantum theory. Okay, um, let me finish with one more. How about something like arsenic? Arsenic's over here, number 33. Um, just one more time reading our periodic table because I have to say one more thing to make sure you do it right. 1s2, trying to get to arsenic. 2s2, 2p6, 3s2, 3p6, 4s2. Now subtract 1 from your 4, so now it becomes 3. 3d10, because we're passing all over all 10 squares. When you get back here, you have to bump back up to 4. You're only doing the n minus 1 while you're doing in the d's. But now you're going to say 4p3. 4p3 would be how you ended that. 
because understand you can't leave it at 3p the 3p you already said the three piece so that's why you bump back up to four and that would be the um, electron configuration for arsenic not that i'm going to ask you but if you if you were to do the s block you would do n minus two from your from your um row number but i'm not going to ask you anything about the f block okay that is reading the periodic table to get electron configurations and if it made sense to you and it's easy, use it. It's great. Um, if you didn't like it, frankly, when I first was taught that, I thought that was confusing and I didn't use it. Fine. If you, as long as you get the right answer, it doesn't matter. Eventually, um, if you stay in chemistry, it will click and then it becomes easy. But don't stress about it. If you didn't like it and if it confused you, you can use the diagonal rule and you'll still get the right answers. Okay. Um, let us now... Uh, Let us now talk about periodic properties. Periodic properties. So this is the last part of chapter eight. And let me go ahead and just list them. Okay, what do I mean by periodic properties? Periodic properties are basically properties or characteristics of elements or atoms, depending you know, how you want to describe it, um, that can be um, determined, or if you, if you like the word predicted, if that makes more sense to you solely based on their position on the periodic table. On the periodic table. There are a bunch of periodic properties. Um, meaning, and I'll, we're going to go through them here. Uh, I'll just pick chlorine. We keep kind of using chlorine. I'll just keep using them. I can tell you quite a bit about chlorine just because he's over here. Um, not just in period three, but also based on what group he's in, um, how far down he's in, and also how far right he is. So I can tell you a lot about chlorine. We'll talk about what you can learn about him. I can talk to you quite a bit about barium. Um, I can talk to you about how, how large the atom is. I can talk to you about ionization energy, what kind of ion he forms. These are all periodic properties. And I'll, we're going to list them here um, just based on the fact that he's here and not like up here or here and not like over there. Um, and so that's what we mean. You can just look at it, find them on the periodic table and be like, oh, this must be, you know, this about this larger or, you know, what we're going to talk about here. So let's just make a list of the ones that we're going to learn. Um, ion formation. Take them one at a time. Two, we're going to be learning about um, uh, atomic radius. And also um, ionic radius. A third periodic property, property that we will learn about is ionization energy. Fourth one is electron affinity. And the last one is metallic character. Okay, so let me go ahead and leave these up on the board. We'll take them one at a time. Some of them take longer than others. Ion formation, we're not going to spend a lot of time on. Um, let me go ahead and erase this top thing so I can have some room. I'll leave my list up. So let's just talk about ion formation real quick. We'll do number one first. Um, ion formation. This is the one that we also, that actually that we already know. This is that, um, is it figure 2.5? one, three, I want to say. This is that one we've been using the whole class long, which is I, uh, atoms in group one form one plus ions. Um, if you're in group two, you form two plus ions. If you're in group three, like aluminum, you'll form three plus, etc. And the, over there, it's the one minus two minus three minus as you, as you walk in. We've been using the ion formation periodic trend all semester long. 
this is what that's talking about. Now, um, let's just remember, and basically I'll just kind of make one point about this and then we're gonna move on to the next ones that are more new. Uh, essentially, just remember, and we mentioned this, I think, in the last video, atoms um, tend to form, tend to form ions um, that give them the same electron configuration as their nearest noble gas. And remember, that the reason why is because the electron configuration of the nearest noble gas is a very stable electron configuration where the orbitals, um, your like valence orbitals are full. Your valence orbitals are full, um, and it's, it gives the atom a very low energy, stable existence, which which it becomes happy with. So just coming back to here, why does, for instance, sodium? form a one plus ion. We know that it forms a one plus because it's in this column, why? Because if you were to write out his electron configuration, it would end with 3s1. If he can just lose that, lose that one electron, he ends up having the same electron configuration as neon. It'll end with 2s2, 2p6. That's a very stable electron configuration. That's why sodium will tend to do that. It's why sodium doesn't, um, it's why, for instance, that's actually, it's why metals don't gain electrons. If sodium was to gain electron, he'd have the same as magnesium, but that's no good. He wants to have the outer electron configuration as the same as the nearest noble gas. That's what makes him stable. Um, it's also why something like chlorine. Why, was, why was, does chlorine not form cations? Well, if chlorine loses electrons, he'll become, like, loses an electron, he'd become like sodium, or sorry, sulfur. That's not helpful. If he gains an electron, he becomes like argon. That's really good. So that's why nonmetals gain electrons. Frankly, nonmetals become near the noble gases through gaining. It's easier to become closer, like they're closer to, to becoming noble gas through gaining. Whereas metals will become like noble gases when they lose, when they lose electrons. So that's also why nonmetals gain, because they're they can become like the noble gases just easily by gaining a few. Whereas metals can become like noble gases by losing one or two, depending on what metal you are. Um, all right, so we've already talked a lot about ion formation. We've kind of been using it all semester, so I'm not gonna spend much extra time on that. But it's all about trying to become like the nearest noble gas, that noble gas envy we've mentioned several times. The atomic radius periodic trend, we're gonna spend the most time on. The others will be pretty quick. Um, all right, atomic radius. What in the world is atomic radius? Well, remember, when you um, overlap all the orbitals together in an atom, the, the atom is going to be, here's your nucleus there in the middle, the atom is going to end up being spherical. Okay, atoms are spherical, okay, not circles, but 3D spheres. The atomic radius is exactly what it says. It's the radius of an atom. So it's essentially this distance, the distance from the middle or the nucleus to the edge of the atom. So really it's a, um, a way or the way to measure the physical size of an atom. Not how much it weighs, okay? We're not talking about mass. We're talking about like the physical size of it. How large is it? How large is the atom? That's what atomic radius is. And that's all I need you to think about with that. We, there's a few more things that sometimes I say, but I'm gonna skip the rest. All right, so let's talk about the trend first. Um, the trend, actually, you know what? I'm gonna change my mind. You guys have this in your notes. I'm gonna erase this. I'm gonna draw a little periodic table right here and we'll put all the trends on the very same periodic table um all right atomic radius ar ar increases as you go down as you go down a column the atomic radius increases let me make that look a little bit more straight 
And with all these periodic trends, what you'll find is that the downward trend is actually always one way, and the across trend is the reverse. So if the atomic radius increases as you go down, the atomic radius decreases as you go across. And that's the trend. So I want you to know the trend. Let me write the word, know the trend. With atomic radius, sometimes people find it helpful to literally draw it in. So something like lithium, let me use lithium. Lithium will actually be smaller than sodium. Sodium is below him. So sodium is literally bigger. And potassium is even bigger. So this kind of like snowman effect is something that you can think about. So the atoms are getting larger and larger as you go down. However, as you go across, they're getting smaller. So lithium is actually somewhat bigger than beryllium. So I made it pretty exaggerated, but that's the trend. Larger, getting bigger as you go down, getting smaller as you go across. Let's go ahead and talk about not only know the trend, but I want you to understand the trend. I want you to also understand the trend, okay? It's one thing to just know it, but let's make sure we understand it. The downward trend is really simple to explain. Why is, oops, why is sodium larger than lithium? Hopefully you can understand um, that lithium's electron configuration, let me actually go ahead and give you a couple things to write here. So lithium versus sodium. Lithium's electron configuration is 1s2, 2s1. His last electron is in a 2s orbital, whereas sodium is 1s2, 2s2, 2p6, 3s1. His last electron is in a 3s orbital. So if you want to make sure you just put this in your notes, sodium's or his last electron is in a larger orbital. Remember, the principal quantum number, the n value, tells you how large the orbital is. A 3s orbital, picture this being the outer one being the 3s orbital, is literally bigger than a 2s orbital, smaller. And that alone is all you really have to know for the downward trend. It's, you're just occupying larger and larger orbitals. Potassium's last electron is in a 4s orbital. Bigger orbital, bigger atom. Because the, the end of the orbital is the end of the atom. Remember, the electrons are just kind of moving around these orbitals, but they are defined. Where they are, and that's the end of the atom. There's no like physical membrane or anything like that. All right, so that's the downward trend. Most people have no problem understanding that. The across trend takes a bit more time, okay? Let's talk about lithium and beryllium. This one, although it's, it's helpful because... Um, uh, because we end up using the same concept for, um, for uh, ionization energy. So if you can learn it kind of once, you end up, and, and if you can understand it right now, you'll be able to get it. So notice I drew lithium slightly larger than beryllium because it is, because as you move across, the atomic radius actually gets smaller. Now, why does it get smaller? See, it's, it's not what you would think because Beryllium actually has one extra proton and one extra electron. So you would think it should be bigger, right? It has more stuff. It should be bigger, but it's not. It's actually smaller. Make sure you understand it is heavier. Beryllium is heavier, weighs more than lithium. That extra proton and another neutron or two, I'm not even depending on my isotope, um, is going to make it heavier. But we're not talking about heaviness or mass. We're talking about physical size. So let's get into why is beryllium smaller. Luckily, um, these are such small atoms that we can really kind of examine the whole thing. So let's talk about a lithium atom. Let's diagram out what it looks like here. So lithium has how many protons? Well, let's talk about its nucleus. It has three protons, meaning its nucleus is a three plus nucleus. Okay, so that's the nucleus of the lithium atom, three plus. Now, his electron configuration, I just drew it a second ago, it was 1s2, 2s1, correct? 1s2, 2s1. So we can literally draw this atom pretty easily. He in a 1s orbital, let me go ahead and do a 1s orbital. 
In a 1s orbital, he has two electrons. Let me go ahead and just put them in. One, two. You really can put them anywhere. Um, they're in the 1s orbital. So that's, that's the 1s orbital. Now he has a last electron in the 2s orbital. The 2s orbital would, will be bigger. Okay. I'll just draw that there. And that is a lithium atom. Okay. So let's talk about this for a minute here. Um, the valence electron, that's, this is the valence electron. These are core electrons. All right, let me give you something right here. Um, the key point here is this. The valence electron is shielded, okay? There, you, there's a, a reading about this in your book, and it's, it's a little bit challenging, but it's really not that hard to understand, so I like to teach it because it's, it's actually easier than it seems. The valence electron, the outside electron, is shielded from the full pull coming from the nucleus. All right. Because understanding this is really, it's, it's so helpful in chemistry because it applies to a lot of different things. You have three protons in your nucleus. They are pulling on your electrons. They're positive, the electrons are negative. They are pulling on them. So when you think about this last electron, which by the way is the one that really matters because where he ends is where the atom ends. And that's what we're interested with atomic radius. Where he lives, like you know, how far away from the nucleus and how close is where the atom's boundaries are. So we wanna think about what is he feeling? The key here is that he doesn't actually feel a three plus full pull. He doesn't feel it because he is actually being shielded um, by the core electrons. So those two core electrons will act like shields. And what they will do is they will block some of that positive charge that's trying to pull, and they'll stand like as shields and kind of neutralize some of it. So what we want to learn is this thing called effective nuclear charge effective nuclear charge. And what this is, is what we label as Z EFF, Z effective. Okay, so essentially the nuclear charge is three plus. That's the nuclear charge, the charge of the nucleus. But effectively, the effective nuclear charge is not three plus. What it is, it's the number of protons, but we wanna subtract the number of core electrons. The core electrons will kind of neutralize some of that positive charge and kind of um, block it. So lithium's Z effective, effective nuclear charge, the, the, what this guy will feel is three, three protons minus two because of two core electrons. So he will feel a plus one nuclear charge. So let's leave that there for a moment. And let's come over to beryllium. Same concept here. Let's go, go ahead and map out beryllium. Beryllium's nucleus is a four plus nucleus. He has four protons, okay? His electron configuration is 1s2, 2s2. So we can kind of diagram him out the same way. So the 1s, let's go ahead and draw that orbital. The 1s orbital, he's got two electrons, just like lithium did, two core electrons. Now, the 2s orbital, I'm going to actually draw it slightly smaller so you'll see, and I'll explain why in just a minute. So notice I drew this circle a little bit smaller in than I did this one. His two outer electrons, the two valence electrons, what will they feel? What kind of pull are they experiencing from the nucleus? Well, it's, a, it's something that we can calculate. Their effective nucle nuclear charge, Z effective, effectively, what will they feel pulling on them? is the number of protons, four, minus the number of core electrons. Because the core electrons are the only guys that shield, okay? The other, they don't shield, the valence electrons don't shield each other, just the core electrons. So it's four protons minus two core electrons, so the effective nuclear charge is plus two for beryllium. And this explains the atomic radius trend. With lithium, he's being pulled. See, the nucleus is pulling him in with a plus one charge. 
whereas these guys on beryllium are being pulled harder with a plus two charge. And a pull, if you're being pulled harder, you literally will go in towards nucleus and that shrinks the atom. And that is the reason why beryllium is smaller than lithium. It's essentially because the effective nuclear charge increases as you go across. I'm going to make that one note on my periodic table because it actually is going to be our reason for the ionization energy trend as well. So we're going to reuse the concept twice. So Z effective increases as you go across. And that is the reason why your atomic radius is actually decreasing as you go across. As I'm erasing, you can picture a bunch of different questions. If I asked you to, um, you know, tell me which atom was larger, just as I'm, er I'm erasing, um, if I said potassium or calcium, which atom is larger, potassium or calcium? The correct answer would be potassium. If I asked you which atom is larger, um, neon or argon, the correct answer would be argon because he's lower on the periodic table. All right, so that's the atomic radius. A quick thing about ion, ionic radius. Ionic radius is just the radius of an ion. So instead of talking about an atom, a neutral atom, we're talking about ions. And this we're going to simplify really, really quickly here. If I was to contrast calcium versus calcium 2 plus. So the parent atom versus his, his ion. Notice for a metal, I picked the, uh, the cation. If I asked you who was larger, so let me find calcium. Regular calcium or calcium 2 plus what would you say? And hopefully you can think of, it. remember, the size of the atom has to do with the electron cloud. The nucleus is so small. It weighs all the, it's, it's all the masses right there. But in terms of the volume, like the size of the atom, it's nothing. The nucleus is nothing. It's all about the electron, the electron cloud. With calcium, his outer electrons are the 4s2 electrons. Okay. What happens when he becomes the 2 plus cation? he loses those last two electrons and he now has the atomic or the um, electron configuration of argon. If you don't see that by looking at your periodic table, go ahead and just write out the electron configurations of calcium and calcium two plus. Remember calcium two plus, you just take off the last two, the last, the four S two electrons are gone. So which one is bigger? Hopefully you will see that the parent atom will be larger than the cation because calcium has the 4s2 electrons. The calcium 2 plus, his outer electrons are in a 3 sublevel, 3s and 3p sublevel, which is physically smaller. So cations are always smaller than their parents. That's what I want you to know. And let's go ahead and pick um, an, an anion. How about something like um, bromine? Just maybe use your common sense here. If cations are smaller than their parents, um, you would be correct to say that anions are larger than their parents. Okay, so anions are larger than their parents, than their parent atoms. The reason why is a little bit different. So if you talk about bromine, regular bromine, his electron configuration would end with um, 4p5. When you add a new electron, it's an, it becomes 4p6, just like krypton. So it's not that you enter a whole new energy level. You don't enter like a brand new orbital. It has to do with the fact that if you add a new electron that didn't used to be there, the electrons will naturally repel each other because they are negative. And if you add a new one, it's like having too many people at the, at the dining room table. They're going to spread out a little bit, okay, just because you have a little bit new extra repulsion coming in. So that's the reason why anions are larger than their parents. That's all I need to say about ionic radius. And we're getting very close to finishing because these last things don't take long at all. Ionization energy. This was the third periodic trend. Ionization energy. This is the, what it is by definition, it's the energy required to remove an electron from a neutral atom. Actually, you know what? Let me make it a little bit more broad, just from, from an atom. The 
because I'm just going to talk about the first ionization energy. So I'm just going to let, let me keep this here. Okay, energy required to remove an electron from an atom. First of all, I want you to notice that if something requires energy, that essentially means that it's endothermic, which means it's a positive num uh, kilojoules or joules. It's a positive number. Um, if you require energy, the energy has to come in to make it happen. And it always takes energy to take an electron off of an atom. Let's know the trend first. The good news is the trend is the literal opposite of atomic radius. So ionization energy decreases as you go down a column, and ionization energy increases as you go across. But so it's, you just literally flip the wording and you'll get the trend. Also, the reasoning you use the exact same reasoning to, to reason out why this trend is the case. Let's just use our same, it won't take me long, let's use our same um, uh, atoms, lithium versus beryllium and lithium versus sodium to explain. All right, so we're talking about removing an electron off of an atom. So with lithium, his outer electron was the 2s1 electron. Whereas sodium, his outer electron is the 3s1 electron. So why does it take ionization energy decreases as you go down? So the ionization energy of sodium is smaller. It's a smaller amount of energy. Why? Well, you could say it two different ways. Um, well, really only, only one way, I suppose. The electron you're trying to remove from sodium is farther away from the nucleus. So it's held on less tightly, okay? Um, this relates to something called Coulomb's law. If you wanted to look that up, you certainly could, but it's, a, it's, a, it, it's the, the calculation of, of the amount of energy between two charged particles. If the two charged particles are very far apart from each other, the, your, the attraction is not that strong. Whereas if they're super close, the attraction is strong. So the farther away from the nucleus, the less tightly you are held. The, you're, you're not going to have to provide much energy to strip them off. Whereas with this one, he's close to the nucleus. You're going to have to provide more energy to try to remove him because he's closer with, to what, it, what he's being held on by. So that's the reason the downward trend. With beryllium and lithium, which is going to be a good thing for the across trend, it has to do with really the same thing as effective nuclear charge. So coming back to what we, what we um, talked about before, with lithium, the effective nuclear charge coming from his uh, nucleus, remember it was one plus, the effective nuclear charge. Whereas with beryllium, it was two plus, the effective nuclear charge. So who's pulling tighter? Well, beryllium's nucleus is pulling tighter. It's, it's pulling harder on his outer electrons so you have to provide more energy to take off an electron than you would for someone who's pulling less tight. And that's why the ionization energy increases as you go across. It's because the effective nuclear charge increases. Think about that until it clicks because it is, it was, it's total common sense, um, but you do have to kind of concentrate on it to understand it. So, but I just, I wanna finish this up here. So that's ionization energy. The next one we want to talk about, the next periodic trend is electron affinity. It's kind of the opposite of ionization energy. Affinity is essentially how much you like something, okay? Um, electron affinity is the energy associated with adding an extra electron to an atom. So with ionization energy, it was trying to take an electron off. With electron affinity, it's trying to add another electron on. The only trend that's a really nice trend um, that's really worth talking about is that electron affinity um, gets more um, negative as you go across or more exothermic. I don't want to say increases or decreases because you're getting, you're, um, it's usually a negative number. It's usually an exothermic process to add an electron on. Um, 
So if you use increases and decreases, it gets confusing because you're talking about negative numbers. So just know that electron affinity gets electron affinity gets more and more exothermic as you move to the right. The only thing I'll really say about that is like your halogens, your chlorine, fluorine, bromine, those have very exothermic electron affinities, which is why they so easily gain electrons. Um, it has to do with the stability of the result, which is becoming like the nearest noble gas. So that is uh, related to electron affinity. Um, just know the trend for that one and know the definition of what electron affinity is. And then the last periodic trend is metallic character. Metallic character is exactly like it sounds. It's, um, does it have, this is me just making up a definition, does it have classic metal characteristics? Metal character, get it? Metal characteristics like shininess, um, conductivity, malleability, etc. How how metal like is it? Well, this one makes a lo whole lot of sense. Um, remember the metals versus the non-metals. Remember that whole thing. Where did our metals lie? Metals were over here, right? Non-metals were over here. So right off the bat, you can very quickly know something about metallic character. Metallic character decreases as you move to the right. Farther you go to the right, the less metally it is. That's why you're not metally at all over here. That's why you're somewhat metally on the metalloids, and that's where you're very metally over here. But for instance, if you were to kind of compare something like um, potassium to like gallium, the metallic character is decreasing as you go to the right. Um, and like all periodic trends, the downward trend is opposite to the across trend. So metallic character, if it decreases as you go to the right, it will increase as you go down, increases. Metallic character increases as you go down. And really the most, the nicest um, kind of trend to see that is if you look at group four, look at group four with me for a minute. Sorry, group four A. Look at um, the elements that are in group four A. Let's just let, listen here. Carbon, silicon, germanium, tin, lead. What we just said is metallic character increases as you go down, and don't you notice it? Okay, carbon not metalish at all. Okay, silicon a metalloid. Germanium you probably don't know much about it, neither do I. But I believe it would be considered a metalloid. Yes, it would. Um, tin. Okay, tin foil. Um, uh, shininess, conductivity, lead. Okay, so now you're getting into classic metals. So this is a good um, example of metallic character increasing as you go down. That is the end of chapter eight. And I didn't, I wanted it to be shorter. It's about the same length as the previous video, but it's about how long I would lecture it in class. So I just, with these, I want you to know what they are. What, it, what are, what do the periodic trends mean? And what are the, what are the trends? Okay. And then also, uh, especially for atomic radius and ionization energy, do you understand this concept of shielding and um, effective nuclear charge? Because that is really kind of drives a lot of the concept. Thanks for your attention. We're done with chapter eight.